theme. James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's enough for now. God bless you. Please be seated. Tonight we're going to engage in prayer over our families as we begin our school year. And uh, school districts vary, you know, when they start school. So we wanted everybody to have a little bit of time to get settled before we had a week of prayer and fasting. And I trust this week that you set aside additional time, days to fast if you don't have a medical, medical condition that prohibits that. And uh, we have students all over our campus tonight. I always like when our kids are here and we have low top tables that go with our high top tables. And I always love reading their prayer requests because they have some legitimate, amazing prayer requests. They'll be praying and having their own services again with uh, you know, all over the campus tonight. We also, we're going to pray for our kids. We're going to pray for all the parents, but also school teachers, administrators, and support staff. And again, we chose this day because we thought uh, it would be better to have this week here. So I've already read this text. We read it Sunday I'm going to do a little bit of review and then some insights about this passage. And then I'm going to share some insights from members of our church family about how they pray for their children. It was very interesting to get this information. Draw near to God, James 4 and 8, and he will draw near to you. Uh, I've been challenged by this invitation to draw near to God. Most of you knew I wrote an article about Engage you know, maybe a month and a half ago. And I talked about Nehemiah in that article. And as I was praying about Sunday, what passage kind of felt right, you know, in prayer to talk about, I just felt that engaging with God in prayer uh, to engage God and to engage the church and to engage the world was the direction that I needed to go. So I've been just kind of mulling this over in my spirit. I think that you should always preach a sermon to yourself first or teach a lesson to yourself first so you can practice what you teach or preach. Um, in that message on Sunday, I spoke briefly about this idea that God shows no partiality. Acts 10, 34 in the New King James, when the apostle Peter preached to the Gentiles, you know, the Lord had to convince him with a vision that was repeated three times. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons in the King James, but in every nation, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, if you will come to God, if you'll draw near to the Lord, um, you work righteousness, you'll be accepted of him. This is really encouraging to me. And for my life work, not everybody is supposed to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, I do believe that we all have our place in the body of Christ. But as a young man growing up in the church from about 16 years of age to somewhere 18 and 19 in that age, I was really seeking the Lord to try to find his will. And even though I love the Lord and was involved in our church and bus ministry, Sunday school, we had an orchestra, I played my trumpet in and sang in the choir and some special groups. Yes, I could sing back then, not like Ryan, but I could sing, you know, good enough. And I remember praying for the will of God. And since this time, I've taught many times messages to young people about finding the will of God. Two kinds of people can miss the will of God. Jonah can run from the will of God. He knows he's the right man. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he's rebellious. He doesn't want to do it and he runs. But then Gideon, he almost misses the will of God because he doesn't believe he's the guy. When the Lord comes to him and calls him a mighty man of valor, Gideon gives all the excuses on the poorest son and the poorest family of the poorest tribe of a nation that's been ransacked by the Midianites for seven years. We, we're, we're wasted. We're, we have nothing left. So Gideon was that guy who just didn't believe that God knew what he was doing when he called him. That was me. And this idea that you don't have to come from a special family or background, that the Lord does not respond to our prayers based on our parentage, our environment, our abilities, our appearance. Thank God for that, right? 
It doesn't matter who you are. If you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. No exceptions. Nobody has an edge on that. And people who do, like the Jews of Jesus's day, ended up being excluded because they thought God owed them a place in the kingdom of God. So regardless of your calling or your mission, if you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Now I spoke about how you do this, but I'm gonna go into a little more detail tonight. James 4 and 8, the second part of that verse. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn. This is really encouraging, right? Now this sounds like an Old Testament prophet. Sounds like Jeremiah, doesn't it? That's where I am, am in my Bible reading. Sounds like Jeremiah, lament. He wrote a book called Lamentations, right? Lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. What a great Wednesday night Bible study. And then he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And this is the part that I, I mentioned Sunday in my message that James gives two things. He said, cleanse your hands, which refers to actions and behaviors. It's the things that you are doing that is not pleasing to God. And we cannot draw near to God while indulging in sinful practices. Drawing near to God re requires that we cleanse our hands. And then James said, purify your hearts you double-minded. So now this addresses attitudes. It addresses motives. It's what makes you tick. And especially with the idea of kind of riding the fence, double-minded. It really wasn't in my notes Sunday, but in one of the two services, I drilled down a little bit of this riding the fence and in the church on Sunday and Monday you do something different or whatever day it might be. But James talks about this being double-minded versus single-minded. If you go back to the first chapter of James, he talks about asking God for wisdom, that he gives wisdom liberally. He doesn't upbraid it or take it away. But James says, if you're going to ask God for wisdom, ask in faith, nothing wavering. Don't be double-minded like he says in chapter 4 that you want it, but you kind of want something else too. You want the wisdom of God, but you want to live by the wisdom of the world. You want the wisdom of God, but you want to compromise on wisdom and maybe in ethics and relationships or somewhere else. James said that if you're double-minded, you're like a wave of the sea that is driven by the wind and tossed. Let that man think that he's going to not think that he will receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all of their ways. In other words, this double-mindedness about God and what you would acquire from God, like wisdom, is a specific thing that James is talking about in chapter one. You need to be all in, not half in, right? Now, this wind-tossed wave that James talks about is different than the normal wave of the sea that's affected by tides. And so I grew up around the ocean. Uh, I love it. And I've seen beautiful waves, you know. It has a, a pattern to a wave, a, a trough and a crest. But I've also seen wind toss waves. And many of you have too, where there are white caps. And maybe the wave goes up and it's the normal wave, but the wind catches that wave. And James said it is it's tossed into the sea and it just kind of disintegrates like that. James said, that a person that is double-minded, he is like a wave of the sea that is driven by the wind and he is tossed. That person that is double-minded, they're not going to receive what they pray for. So when James in chapter four, verse eight, talks about our motives, it's important that when we pray, that we come to God in sincerity. Now the Bible teaches about the, the balance of sincerity and truth. And I've illustrated this several times that, you know, 5,000 units of sincerity will not make up for zero units of truth. If I'm in the frozen north 
and I'm going to walk out on a frozen river. It is not my faith in the thickness of the ice that will hold me up. It is the thickness of the ice. And you can have a lot of sincerity in something that is not true, and that will not hold you up in the judgment and in eternity. Sincerity is important, and we don't need to just kind of beat the drum of truth and not be sincere with God. It takes this and that to be saved, sincerity and truth. In our world, there's a real high emphasis on sincerity. Oh, they really believe that. They're sincere in their beliefs, and that is commendable. But it's our responsibility, not just to affirm their sincerity, but to lead them to truth so that they can have both. Amen. No, James, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Verse 9, lament, mourn, weep, let your laughter be turned into joy. And I know the joy of the Lord is your strength, but you're not going to get the joy of the Lord if there's sin in your life. So James is dealing with some people who are pretty frivolous about their faith. You know, they've just kind of see God as like this grandfatherly old God who doesn't care how you live. This is very stern teaching in the book of James that he's telling them, you guys need to really get serious about your faith. Evidently, they were superficial. They're double-minded. They've got sin on their hands, right? And impure motives in their heart. And James is calling them to serious repentance to get their lives right for God. Jesus spoke about the importance of getting our motives right, of being sincere and and serious about our faith, not living a hedonistic life where it's all about pleasure and all about us, where people say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We know that we're living for eternity. And our faith is full of joy because it's undergirded by a sober-mindedness that the Bible talks about. Because there are many people in our culture that call themselves Christian, but they slipped into carnality and they kind of condone behaviors because they might say, well, I'm not as bad as someone else, or God is a God of grace and mercy, and all of that is true. But we understand the balancing principles of the Word of God. So drawing near to God means changing your mind, repenting, cleansing your hands, purifying your heart so you can genuinely be right with God. Now, Paul was talking to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, and they were worshiping the unknown God. And Paul said, you ignorantly worship him, but I declare him unto you. And he said, in times past, God winked at this ignorance. He sort of looked the other way. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. He's appointed a day when he's going to judge the world by Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul brings these pagan people. They had probably never heard a sermon, knew very little about Jesus Christ, if anything at all. This might have been their first exposure to Christianity. But he tells them the seriousness of turning from your sins to God. In Hebrews, the Bible said we are receiving an unshakable kingdom. But then in Hebrews 12, 29, the writer of Hebrews said, for our God is a consuming fire. I'm just undergirding this idea of the seriousness of being right with God, that when we say draw near to God, it means getting thoroughly right with God, cleaning up our heart so that we can come into his presence. Verse 10, James 4 and 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. So James kind of wraps this up. It says, here's the bottom line, that if you will put yourself in a position of submission to God, that the Lord will lift you up. Earlier in chapter four, he talks about submitting to God so you have the power to resist the devil. The apostle Peter has a lot of parallel writings in his epistles to the book of James. James says to humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. That's why in the church, in the Christian faith, 
We do not believe that we should exalt ourselves, that we should seek the preeminence or to make something of ourselves. But if we humble ourselves before God, it is God in due time who will exalt us to whatever role, whatever position, whatever place of anointing that he chooses in our life. Now, James gives us some relief here at the end of this very stern, serious passage that God will see this getting right with him and drawing near to him and he will lift you up. So I've thought about this passage and this whole idea. You know, I've just felt the hunger for God in my own spirit. Perhaps you feel the same way. And in prayer, there are various dimensions of prayer, of repenting, consecration and cleansing. And that should always be a part of our life. There's worship and intercession and petition. And I'm not trying to teach on the aspects of prayer tonight. Prayer is multidimensional. And in our prayer, we should not limit ourselves to praying in the spirit or praying with the understanding. The apostle Paul said that we should pray with all prayer and it should come from the sincerity of our heart. Isaiah wrote about those who drew near to the Lord with their lips, but their heart was far from him whether it's your private devotion or you come to church and the praise team is leading us in worship, we need to always check our spirit to make sure that our worship to God comes from a sincere heart that has been cleansed and right with him so that we can lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting, amen, in the presence of the Lord. Jesus quoted Isaiah about people who are superficially religious but I feel that there's a deep hunger in our church. I was thinking about a couple passages. I just want to refer to them when David said, as the deer is panting after the water brooks, the heart in the King James. So panteth my soul after you. It depicts an animal maybe running from the dogs or not finding water and is searching for a brook, a stream to get a drink. And David said, my heart, feels toward God like a thirsty animal running for its life. I am thirsty for God. I am hungry for the presence of the Lord in my life. Amen. Psalm 91 speaks similarly about a desire from the Lord. And the Lord said, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early will find me. Paul told those same Athenians that they should feel after the Lord and find him, though he be not far from every one of them. Jeremiah said, after the Babylonian captivity, you will call on me and you will go and pray unto me and I will hearken to me and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Don't you want God to be found of you? Don't you want the Lord to respond to your prayers? Amen. So I want to encourage you in this season of prayer and fasting to go after God from the depth of your soul. To reach out after God, to be hungry for him and know without any stipulation besides that cleansing part, that if you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. There's a secret place. There's a place of depth in the word of God that we can have. If we will draw near to God, he will draw near to us. So I wanted to give this Bible study to connect to Sunday I really talk more about engaging in the church and various facets, but I wanted to come back around. I felt just directed to just to revisit, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So I want to make a hard turn here and I want to talk a little bit about prayer over our children. So this is kind of like an abnormally, hopefully an abnormally hard turn in this Bible study. Maybe may, you won't get a whiplash like somebody's driving you with the stick shift manual transmission car. Sunday evening, I had this idea. I thought, what if we could ask our people, how do they pray for their children? So Ryan helped me. We put a, posted a poll on our church family Facebook page. If you're not part of that and you attend our church, if you'll contact our church office or go there. We'll approve you if you or attending member of our church. So we posted a survey there to ask parents how they pray for their children. We got quite a few responses. It was all in a spreadsheet. So then I reached out to Alex Newman to 
use his brilliance to help me make it easier. So he, and he said, brother, chat GPT, gave a little insight. And so I'm going to share with you some prayers of people in our church. I have permission from almost everybody to share their names, but I'm not going to do that tonight. But I felt like I would open up with a prayer that my wife prayed over our boys. Now, our boys attended a Christian school all of their, you know, elementary, middle school, and high school career. So they still needed all the normal prayers that you pray for. But my wife's prayer included a request that one of our boys would stay awake in class. And I don't want to mention any names just in case they would be embarrassed. But uh, I just wanted to say that that was my wife's prayer. What did I say? <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me make some general observations. Thank you for being so intentional. Our parents are amazing. One family has a place they pass on the way to school, and that's their trigger for when they start praying. And this is connected in my Bible study, but I'm not in James anymore, you know. I'm giving some application of how our people pray teaching our children to draw near to God. And they take turns praying on the way to school, two boys in this particular family. Actually, boy and a girl, I'm thinking of another family member of theirs. One family meets in the living room before they go to school. They hold hands and pray. This mom said, we have teenage sons that drive, so we pray for protection on the vehicle. I appreciate the consistency. Many of our parents... Pray the blood of Jesus Christ to cover their children. Some families listen to devotions on the way to school to make good use of that commute time. And then I'm going to give you some specific areas of prayer. We'll see these on the screen. And when we go into our prayer time, you'll see these kind of cycling around so you can pray for them. And uh, we'll try to make these available to you later. So these are summaries with a few direct quotes. But most of the prayers focus on asking for God's protection, for safety for our children, physically and spiritually. Protection from harm and accidents, from negative influences and from evil. Protection for their eyes and ears for what they may hear. An army of angels, several parents prayed for angelic protection. One student that used to attend our school here used to put on the armor of God before school. So that's a pretty cool thing, right? Or maybe he said he did. There's a story behind that. Uh, One parent prays against political and social agendas that might go against the Bible, humanistic ideologies that their children may hear in the public school setting. If your children go to a Christian school that is not apostolic, you might say that same prayer and be guarded against false doctrine that they may hear there. One family, and probably others, pray for our country, our president, for the pastor of our church, and for leaders, for their school principals. They pray for them by name, and they have more than one child. The second area is for guidance and wisdom. Many of the parents who responded asked for God's guidance and wisdom for their children, especially in their academic pursuits. This includes asking for clarity, understanding, and the ability to learn effectively. The next area is for favor and success. I don't know if this means take your teacher an apple or to be the teacher's pet, but prayers frequently included requests for favor with teachers and peers and the school staff. You know, when Daniel and the three Hebrew boys went to Babylon, they had favor. There was an excellent spirit in them. So we're not just praying for favoritism, but that our children would have character, that they would have a good attitude that would attract the favor of people that would notice how special godly children are in their schools. They pray to get along with their teacher. And that came from a homeschool parent. Again, parents pray for their children's success in school, including good grades on assignments and tests, good comprehension, the ability to excel in their studies and extracurricular activities. They wanted God to use 
them with their God-given abilities. That's good for you to know your child's giftings, their nature, their natural bent, and, and to kind of work with that. Someone would say, put wood where the fire is. If there's already an interest and an ability there, then you should work with that ability so they could excel in that. That's a lot better than trying then to trying to focus on something they have no interest in or they're not very good at. The next area is for spiritual growth and boldness. There's usually in these prayers a strong emphasis on spiritual growth, asking for children to be bold in their faith, to stand out as a Christian, and to be a light to others or a light in the darkness of the culture of this world. This includes prayers for that their children to use their God-given talents, this is kind of a repeat, but to positively influence those around them. So not just have their talents, but those talents would be used to help other students. And one parent said, in my out loud prayers with them in the car, I remind them that they were made to stand out and to be set apart. So I pray that they would embrace that they are different and not be ashamed. One parent said, I pray for our children that they would be world changers. The next area, they pray for children to have good behavior and character development. Prayers often request help with maintaining good behavior, using good manners. I think those have to be taught, right? Developing strong character traits such as kindness, friendliness, and being a good example to others, to exhibit good attitudes. Some of these kind of, you know, are repetitive in a way, but good attitudes. And uh, one parent prays the night before that God would give their children a good night's rest. Another area of prayer is for emotional and mental well-being. Remember, I think it was that first prayer was protection mentally and emotionally. So this is for well-being. Uh, asking for peace, the ability to handle stress, protection against negative thoughts and influences. Several years ago, I was teaching a series of messages on Wednesday nights about keys to success in life. One of those messages that I've repeated standalone was on resilience, the ability to bounce back against adversity, setback and failure. We want our children to know that failure is not fatal and it is not final. That if they fail, right, they can get up from that. A good man, a righteous man falls seven times. He rises up again, right? And we teach our children rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. Though I fall, I shall arise. Amen? So that's the way we want our children to be. Handle stress, protection against negative thoughts and influences. The next area is for health and physical well-being. Parents pray for their children's health, asking for protection from illness, strength to handle their daily activities. And then family and relationships. In their prayers, uh, many of the the parents said, or several parents said, you know, there's needs in our family or that we're aware of, and we include those prayer requests, things that we might need to pray about that are not routinely our prayer But things that come up, you know, I'm going to say situationally, uh, that was not the exact wording in those. So their prayers for the family as a whole, asking for unity, love, support inside the family. Some prayers include requests for the children's relationships with friends, asking for good friendships and positive social interactions. There was a book written several years ago. Everything I needed to know, I learned right in kindergarten or, you know, you learn a lot of things by interaction in your family. That's the first school and uh, wherever you interact with other people. And there will always be challenges, problems, disagreements, offenses. Your children are going to get their feelings hurt and you don't need to come swooping in and try to rescue them from every bump or bruise, whether it's physically or emotionally, you need to help them forgive, get through it, overcome it, and have a good attitude in spite of it. Because guess what? Last time I checked, that's kind of the way life goes, right? There's a prayer for God's will 
and God's plan in their life. Isn't this a, a lot of great prayer points? These are, this is information from our parents and our church. Many prayers include a submission to God's will and plan for the children's lives, asking for God's guidance in their daily activities and future decisions. Great prayer. And then many of the prayers ended with thanksgiving and gratitude, thanking God for blessings, acknowledging God's presence and goodness in their lives. And one parent said, even when our day does not go very well, when it goes poorly, we try to always pray, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. At the end of the day, we're going to look to God. We're going to thank the Lord. We made it through the day and tomorrow's going to be a brand new day and his mercies are new every morning, right? I'm kind of adding to that a little bit, but that's probably good. Thanking the Lord for another day and praising him. And numerous numbers of our families, they recite Bible verses. They, I mentioned listening to devotions and that's kind of the way they pray on the way to school, and they have the word of God. Now, when you teach Deuteronomy 6 about, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you're to teach it diligently to your children, and then talk about it. When your house, when you're in your house, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you walk by the way. So I thank God for our families. Many of our families are praying on their commute to school in the morning, at night. Thank you for being so intentional. One more prayer. This was one of the respondents who was a teacher. And this teacher said, I am, I'm responding to this as a teacher and uh, praying for my students. And so it's pretty neat. She teaches students with autism, intellectual challenges, and behavioral issues. And the prayer is a, a, for the student's safety the ability to learn. She prays for herself that God will help her show love and kindness. I don't think she said patience, but that's probably a part of that prayer. There's a dual focus both on the students and her own role as uh, an educator that is distinctive. This came from a person that I did not even know was a teacher. This teacher views her job as a ministry, highlighting a deep commitment to her profession and the well-being of her students. She prays that God would help her demonstrate love and kindness, which some of her students may not experience elsewhere. I've had one of our people that teach at a school, that work in a school, and told me that there are over 20 students that basically don't get a good meal. They're essentially homeless. That's somebody in our church that's trying to help students in their school that have no family support or very little at all, that are just, the only hope they have is for somebody to love them that loves God. And this teacher, she prays for the family situation of her students. She's aware of the concern of lives outside of school that adds a holistic dimension to her prayers. And she said, I'm answering as a teacher of special needs, which includes all those areas I mentioned earlier. And on my way to school in my car, I pray over my students and for myself. I pray for our safety, pray for our safety, our ability to learn and the family situations I already mentioned. And as I said, she said, I'm quoting her now, my job is my ministry. I pray to show love and kindness that some may never see anywhere else. I mentioned that, but I wanted to quote her on that. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer now. And you'll see these prayer points scrolling on the screen. And I want you to pray whatever's on your heart. For those of you who may not have been in one of our Wednesday night prayer meetings, you're welcome to come to the altar, kneel where you're seated, Come to the front, walk and pray. You'll see cards on these tables, six tables, three in the front, three in the back. You can write a prayer request on that card and then go pick up somebody else's card, pray over that, put it back down on any table you choose. And we're just gonna circulate like that through this evening in a time of prayer. And uh, when you're finished, leave it on the table. But before you go tonight, if you'll take several cards home with you and pray over them, I'd like to ask that you not write anything confidential on a card. And whatever you read on a card, please don't post on social media. If you're able, please stand. We're going to enter a time of prayer. And I may or may not give a formal dismissal. 
but we kind of have a playlist and a time of focused prayer. Let's lift our hands to the Lord right now before we even enter into prayer. And let's enter into this season of prayer by thanking God for his goodness and his mercy in our lives. Lord, I love you, Lord, and I thank you. At this season, as our students go back to school, we've got college students that are moving into dorms this Saturday, and some have already started their, their school classes and I pray, Lord, that as we pray today, that our pray, prayers would be effective, they would be fervent, that they would give protection and all of the things that our students need and the support of their church family. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God bless you for engaging the Lord in prayer tonight.